down on the aging on that one. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Which one is this? It's a oh, that's one of the museum collection one. Yeah. Oh, that's one of the ones from Withertop. Oh. You I mean, this is the Morgul blade? No, or no, no, this no, is one of the yeah. Hobbit's blades. Yeah. yeah. So this is one one of the ones that Aragorn hands out for Withertop. Right. And in I, the in the book, I could never remember who which. Yeah. You know, I yeah. can never remember which of the Hobbits has which of the swords, but yeah. The, um, you'll get to read this sometime on thewondering.net. There's yeah. this article I wrote, Outraged or Bemused? Mm -hmm. The Ultimate Collector's Edition Blu-ray Galvanizes mm. Fans. <laughs> which is, you know, my angry mm -hmm. op-ed yep. piece about mm -hmm. what is this business? With them Pretty much. insulting us. You gotta, yeah, and there's the story. Because you could go out and buy all the box sets now on, probably they'll be on remainder even. Yeah, of course. For of course. a fraction of that. I know. A total fraction of that. Looks like we're getting there. More than geographical. Under consideration. <coughs> Sorry, I haven't seen a lot of these up close before. It's, it's a little stuck, so just. Yeah, the problem is if I do that, it's going to be... <laughs> oh, sorry about the wall. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pull it. I'll just, okay. I'll just pick it up. Can't do the, the whole... Uh, not in this room. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. That's good. Oh, that's beautiful. Hmm. I mean, for the price point they're selling these at, a lot of these are really, really gorgeous swords. Though I have heard that some of the ones that have sold out are going for ridiculous money on eBay. Like this now. one. Really? This yeah. one is. Well, that Isildur's sword? Yeah. The one like that's I've hard heard, to get? I've that's, heard about $1,000 for some of them. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And they originally, you could like get them. Like 200 bucks. Yeah. And I saw about 170 that a lot of them were being sold this at. This is, so. like, this is upwards of 1000 now. Wow. I mean, wow. Business. Same with that. Yeah. Starting Makes me feel a bit better about what Wet is charging for some of the high end collectibles. Yeah. <laughs> it's not cheap. Well, how so about that? Scoot your chair over like six inches. Perfect. Okay. And me too. Yeah. Do you want me to face the center of the table or no, face that's more fine. of the camera? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I suppose this way you can just talk oh, to yeah. us. No, you could. It's oh, great. Yeah, there we go. Let's talk swords. Mm. There you go, everybody. Yep. We're about to go live. <laughs> so, um, wow, this is great. This is really, really yeah. great. So if I hadn't been here, what would you have done today? Uh, <laughs> we would have talked more about the issues that were brought up by Michael Pellerin last week, ah, because yep. he revealed a lot mm -hmm. of information, mm -hmm. confirming Studio, you know, things that Warner Brothers, the studio, would not confirm. Yep. Mm -hmm. He confirmed things, and I had a, a special email from Peter Jackson, mm -hmm. and he wanted to address the issue about those Blu rays in yep. the box set. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had, you know, we probably would have revisited uh, some of that information, and then we would have probably talked about what the fans plan on doing, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of noise in the wind about how the fans want to support maybe uh, a Kickstarter or maybe some yep. other kind of mm -hmm. crowdfunding mm -hmm. to get those other. Get, get it done the way documentary is produced and made yep. and everybody mm. who participates in it could be guaranteed mm -hmm. to actually have it. Yep. You know, it'd be fantastic. Mm. So there we go, there we go. See, so um, uh, getting the fans excited mm -hmm. about things mm. and getting the fans focused and yeah. purposeful <laughs> is what Good we do. On. Good luck on that. Yeah, I know. That's what we do. Yeah. Com phrases like herding cats come to mind. Herding <laughs> cats. Well, yeah, that's true. Well, when you come to this fandom, we're, a lot of these fans are rediscovering Middle Earth mm -hmm. films now. Yes. They weren't alive 16 years ago when yeah. Fellowship was released. Yeah, I mean, it's hard, so, to, hard yeah. to actually appreciate how long ago it was. My gosh, I know, right? It was like a different part of my life. Still sharp. Still sharp. <laughs> Still sharp. A little, <laughs> ah, a little reference for uh, uh, Mr. Sean Bean from his previous yep. British TV show mm. where he played uh, sharp. Um, <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Wow, it's Torn Tuesday. Exciting. Yes, we it is. Torn Tuesday. We are excited yeah. because we've got a whole bunch of metal here, uh, and we got a metal head here. Yeah. Did you listen to heavy metal? No. 
Nope. No. Nope. Uh, you put it no, all. I just make heavy metal. <laughs> 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 this is the real deal. Uh, this is the got, real deal. We've got li- uh, all the way from New Zealand, mm-hmm. Peter Lyon. All the way Thank from you. New Zealand, Peter Lyon. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, I think this man is very familiar to many of you kids who are watching the appendices <laughs> and watching the behind the scenes. Yeah. And a lot of you are collectors going to uh, these, uh, you know, these people who are manufacturing replicas. But we're going to talk about the real deal, uh, not just the replicas. We are in the presence of the swordsmith who had the most experience in New Zealand. And he happened to live right there around yeah. the corner from mm-hmm. the people at Three Foot Six, the production company. Couldn't have found a better ally in their great journey to make six Middle Earth films. And this man, Peter Lyon, very much a Mm -hmm. pleasure to have you here as our guest all the way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm I'm the co-host of this show, Clifford. This is Justin. This is Torn Mm -hmm. Tuesday, the one ring.net. And we're Mm -hmm. very glad to have you live with us on the live stream. And we're watching chat rooms. We got Facebook chat. We got the one ring.net slash live chat. Mm -hmm. Hello from Mexico. Hello, Mexico. It's great to see you. And we're taking phone calls on the hotline. You can text us (laughs) questions. If you've got any questions you've always wanted to ask, text us 530-64-FRODO. The the phone number is really our phone number. It scrolls right above our heads. It is scrolling. Uh, right there. So oh, hey, he's that's, clever. That's really our phone number. 530, number six, number four, F-R-O-D-O. Hello, We've Sarah, got Hannah. people watching from Finland, from Syria. Yeah. Yes. Just tuned in. Wow, from hello. From Arkansas. Hello, hello from Syria. You've it's got, great to have you. People around you the world. Quite the, quite wow. the worldwide fandom. I guess that's, that, that's a great <laughs> question to start with. Can, can you believe just how universal these movies have become mm-hmm. in every corner of the world? I think I can now, it, but when I was working on them, it was really a case of I couldn't see the forest for the trees. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, being too close to the cliff face, mm, so but, to speak. But, yeah, but mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I keep hearing all these stories that about you know the countries like China, Syria, the Middle East, where you know all the stories that we think of as a, a Western thing are yeah. still very relevant and they resonate over there too. Yeah, and uh, but it's not surprising because. The themes of Lord of the Rings and in The Hobbit are universal. They mm-hmm. are. Although Professor Tolkien was very much driving what he thought would be mm. a new mythology for England, yeah. a bit of really mm. English storytelling, mm-hmm. yeah. very, very Northern European in all of yeah. its influences. Mm-hmm. Uh, then, and look, they translate well. Yes, I mean, they I mean very well. across all mm-hmm. these languages, they uh, do. Uh, yeah. th- these stories. Because, you know, things get lost in translation, mm-hmm. and he's creating yep. his own languages on top yes. of translating <laughs> yeah. four other languages. Yeah. But, uh, interesting, I did some d- uh, talks over in Sweden uh, at the start of this holiday. I love Sweden. Uh, talking talking love about the sword and mythology and the mythology of the sword. Mm-hmm. And I, I gave a, a talk on my own uh, about the sword as a storytelling device. Yeah. And it all comes down to storytelling. The history of the sword, according to Wikipedia, Mm -hmm. earliest (laughs) examples of the sword date back to the Bronze Age, to 1600 BC. Yep, or earlier. Or earlier. Yes. And then there uh, there was the dagger first, Mm -hmm. really. Throughout the course of mankind, Mm -hmm. there was the dagger first. And then someone else had the bright idea, Mm. I can reach the enemy further if I have a better weapon. And that's all about metallurgy. Uh The only reason you can make a sword longer is if your metal is better so you can trust it. Mm-hmm. That's, right. that's why they started off with, you know, shorter swords, leaf blades, things like that, mm-hmm. that they could trust that they could hit something hard and it wouldn't just shatter. Right. And then you get to things like, you know, something like, say, Anderil, a, a classic cruciform style sword from the Middle Ages, mm-hmm. tempered spring steel. That's the sort of steel you can trust to make a blade that long and not have it break on you. Because, of course, that's fatal in combat. I'm fascinated by metallurgy and chemical reactions. Mm-hmm. And I'm, uh, c- chemistry, it's a cool thing. You know, Bill Nye here, mm-hmm. science is cool. But yeah. <laughs> how long did it take for humankind to develop other alloys mm-hmm. at that period of our early development where we could trust the metal to not shatter? Um, okay, well, and even, the next question is, bronzes, would, yeah. sh- would it shatter like this? Ah, how likely okay. is it <laughs> that this type of shattering yeah. would happen on a blade made this way? That was my next question. Okay, I'll start with the first one. Right? <laughs> yeah, alloys. Okay, so you've got bronze. So the, the earliest bronzes were tin bronzes. Mm. Then, uh, and th- they're much better than copper. Yeah. So your earliest reference was straight copper, which tends to be soft. Yeah. You can work hard on it a bit with hammering, but yeah. you've got to do it very carefully because if you overdo it, then you get something that's too brittle again. Mm. 
tin bronzes were a bit better. You could you could push them further. Uh, arsenical bronzes were better again. Mm. Obvious difficulties with arsenic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I get it. So, and and this, these developments were happening yes. at what period in history? Uh, this is all probably up to about 1000 BC. So by then, bronzes were pretty well fully developed. Mm. Iron was coming in. Funnily enough, iron wasn't valued initially because it was hard to produce and nobody could figure out really what do we want to do with this? Because early, uh. because basically iron doesn't make good swords. It's too soft. Mm -hmm. it, was oh. when, it was only when you could start controlling the amount of carbon to an exact degree and then a other alloys to get different properties and make it more springy, suddenly Ow. steel became useful. So, I so, see. Mm. So, yeah. It's all chemistry, yep. right? Pretty much, yeah. Yep. And, and also, yeah, today I select a bit of steel to make a blade. I've got specification sheets, and I know that they manufacture thousands of tons of this stuff, and yeah. I'll get pretty much what's on the spec sheet. Back then, they got a bit of metal, often from somebody traveling around selling uh, ingots, and they first of all had to figure out what was it good for. Like, yes. would it make a good sword blade, or is it something you should have like made an agricultural tool out of. You know, ah, made, right. you know. So first of all, they had to figure out what the materials were that they had. Mm -hmm. yeah. I get yeah. it. We so, had a question in the chat room right now. Well, you know, uh, a, a lot of fans, yeah. we, we, when we announced that you were coming on the show, yep. a lot of fans posted pictures of their collections. Yep. I mean, yes, if you is. buy one yeah, sword, yeah, you yeah, buy I, a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I've, Obviously. Seen, I've seen a few pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, and so there was a question, uh, the Master yes. Smith <clears throat> collection. Yes. That's a, that's a Weta yes. collection yep. that you run. Yep. Uh, what is, uh, A, are you doing it anymore? And B, what is so special about the Master Smith Okay, yes, we are still doing them. Uh, what's happened is that we do them release by release pretty much, so there might be a couple of releases overlapping, but uh, once, the, once the number limit is reached, that's it for that collectible. Um, and what's special about them is that I'm making them. I made the originals. I'm making these. <laughs> I have the originals on hand. Yeah when I'm making the replicas, so I can get everything exact as, uh, in fact, even better than the originals, because bear in mind that I made the originals up to 18 years ago, so I've learned a few things since then. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can make them even better for those people that will just stand there and look at them for hours and spot every little thing mm -hmm. that uh, you didn't spot in the original film because you never saw it still long enough. But we are right. still doing them. Um, the, the addition of Sting is pretty much finished, I think. And there is... There's uh, Sting. Let's get Sting. Let's get Sting right let's here. Let's get Sting. I yes. think this is Sting. Yes. I watch. That is Sting. <laughs> this is uh, a replica of Sting. This mm -hmm. is not the actual inlaid silver. This no. is like a print, right, on the wood. But I watched that 11-minute video. Mm -hmm. That yes. was, uh, I think, that came out in two thousand nine or yep. two thousand six yep. with Richard Taylor. Uh, yep. uh, so Showing graciously, this. yeah, this is great. Everybody here, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is a letter opener, really, <laughs> according to Ballin. But we yeah. know better. Yeah. We know better, mm -hmm. and a few spiders and Merck yep. would know better too. Yeah, that's not so, a bad little. This is awesome. Th so there have been multiple companies that make the replicas. Mm -hmm. We've had yes. the, the the Noble Collection, I believe. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, did uh, uh, Weta Workshop does it? Yep. Uh, um, did Sideshow oh. ever do any? I don't think so. Uh, the, the, the deal with Sideshow was for the figures. Yeah, uh, but not for full scale. Yeah. yeah. So but there's only been two. United Cutlery. United Cutlery, a yeah. third one. United yeah. Cutlery, mm -hmm. Noble Collection, right? Did, mm -hmm. And so did you consult with uh, on any of the other ones, or do you only work on the Weta Workshop collectibles? Only on the Weta Workshop collectibles. Mm -hmm. And so what they are, they're very limited editions, so we're not making a 1,000, we're making like the Sting edition with the silver inlaid grip, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. only 25 of those available. Only they're, they're an awful lot of work. That wasn't. I Just watching the video, I felt like, oh, my God, how many times yeah. do you cut your hands trying to get that in there? <laughs> yeah. So do you only very create impressive. one uh, series of the Master Smith collection that's sold out, or do you create uh, different versions of, like, like, is there only um, one Sting Master Smith, or will there be others? Oh, there, there will probably only be one. Would we do one for, say, well, would we do one for The Hobbit? Depends if we got the license, I guess. But the oh. the Lord of the Rings one, the silver inlaid one, was the one that was most popular. But there is a film edition, which is the transfers. But funnily enough, even though the transfer one is more accurate to the film, the collectors see the silver inlay and say, I want. 
<laughs> Pretty much. They do. And I can understand that. Right, Dylan? Yes. <laughs> right, right, Kyle. <laughs> For sure. We, we have so yep. many collectors, uh, not only on staff, but yep. uh, fans that continually post yes. on, on Instagram, yep. like, mm-hmm. You yeah. know, new new yeah. addition to the yeah. collection, and uh, <laughs> I mean, when I get back home, hopefully I'll uh, have some news about our the next one that is under planning at the moment, uh. which is Boromir's sword. Oh yes, Boromir's I, sword. Yes, and which I <laughs> my wallet screen guarding. Uh, yeah. In the I mean, studio, our collector just said, yeah. my wallet is screaming out in pain. <laughs> yes. Not yet. Give it time. <laughs> okay. Now back to this 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 ah, question yes. about how does yes. metal break? If generally if, not like that. Generally not like this. No. So this is a bit of artistic license. It is. Okay. I actually did a couple of tests when I was told about having to break the Narsal swords mm-hmm. to see if I could actually do anything like that by just doing a simple break. And of course, no. What happens is a sword generally wants to just break straight across. Yeah. Sometimes if there's a flaw in the steel, it might break in a sort of a pattern like that. But mm-hmm. that's about it. So this is and a far... Far different. Far different. Yeah. So, but, and of course, what was it, seven seven or eight fragments? Yes. Yeah. Right. What I had to do was I got a, a little uh, motor, uh, Dremel motor tool with a cutoff blade, and I'd actually follow the, the brake lines, oh. cut it about halfway through on the back, do that on all the bits that are going to break, yeah. and then clamped it in a vise, and then got pliers, and basically went and cracked it along that Oh, line really? Cool. To make it happen. Oh, that's excellent. <laughs> yeah. I just thought it was just Sala Baker and his big, fat <laughs> foot who just stepped on the poor thing. That was and actually the, Richard Taylor's foot. What well, was Richard Taylor's foot in that shot? I thought it was Sala yeah, Baker in that actually, shot. Oh, it might have been. He was stepping on because that blade. We, because we originally shot that up at Ruapehu. Yeah. Richard Taylor was wearing Sauron's boot that day. Oh. And we got this beautiful shot of of Elendil lifting the sword off the ground and the foot just going smash through it. Yes. Mm. But... It all had to be reshot in the studio later oh, yeah. because they had to do stuff and they couldn't match the backgrounds. Oh, and yeah. so they said, okay, we'll just reshoot the whole thing in the studio. So that's why you see it on the ground, bang, and, it, and then yes. it pulls it out. Oh, my God. But the shot of it breaking in midair was spectacularly beautiful. It is. <laughs> and, and we will never see it, probably, unfortunately. Ah, God. Unless, unless, unless it's on ultimate DVD. Unless it's on the, yeah, the super ultimate everything you might ever want in 10 lifetimes collection. <laughs> we call that the unicorn edition. Yes, sir. That's what the fans call it. We, we just had Michael Peller in here yes, last week. And just he was last week. telling yeah. us. He's got plans for all of that footage <laughs> that just stuff. yes, is it's sitting all there. sitting there, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it yeah. is, and it's ready to go. Well, it needs some investment. Mm. They need to scan some of yeah. the sources. We just from got a text mm. message uh, again on the hotline <laughs> asking questions. What was Peter Jackson's first impression of Narsal? Of Narsal. When he first saw it. Yes. It, was there a, like an epiphany, or is he just so involved throughout the process? This is this is Narsal. What I'm holding yeah. in my hand is not yes. to be confused with what later became of the Flame of the West and Duril, mm. right? Right? This is yeah. Narsal. Yeah. Right. Though visually, the only difference is that Andural has the etching on the blade. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that was just so that people would recognize that it's the same sword. Yes. Um, I'm not actually quite sure what Peter's initial reaction was because no. I wasn't involved in all the design meetings. Yes. Um, and of course, Peter is not the most effusive person at times. <laughs> so it's like, uh huh, yep. Yep, good. that's good. Yep, yep, yep. that's good. <laughs> That's right. Yep. And then we get all the feedback yep. later. Yep, that's good. That's good. That'll be fine. We'll, we'll go with that. That's good. Yep. Now, uh, I also want to say there's another thing about the extended editions which is important to us as fans and to Peter mm. as a storyteller yep. because he was adding mm. much more threads mm. to make all six oh, yeah. of these movies a c- cohesive whole. Yes. To see Martin Freeman mm-hmm. walk into the room mm-hmm. into that beautiful atrium in Rivendell yes. and to mm-hmm. have him come up there and look at these shards of mm-hmm. Narsil yep. and to have and uh, and to have him look at the mm-hmm. painting on the wall mm. of yes. you know the dark lord yep. against poor poor they, had, they had to reproduce all that of course because did, yeah. those sets were long gone long mm-hmm. gone but i love that and yep. i think that's very yes. important yep. and 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 sometimes mm-hmm. people who are newbies who don't even know the story they text me and they say what are those broken pieces of a sword why is that important? And watch I text all, back. And watch all the movies. Watch and all then, the movies. Yeah. You'll, you'll eventually yeah. learn. Um, you'll yeah, eventually we actually learn. have yeah. a plan this Christmas, especially once I get the, the fancy new TV that I, I want to get, mm. um, is to watch all three parts of The Hobbit yeah. and all three parts of The Lord of the Rings in the sequence that they should be watched. Yes. Because Peter put a lot of effort into getting 
all those links working. Yep. Yeah. Very much so. Very it, much it, so. It holds up. I mean, fans are doing. Fans are doing yeah. that. It does. Mm. It now, time. here's a question about a blade. That mm -hmm. blade yes. that came out of the Angmar tomb yes. that uh, causes Kate oh, yeah, Blanchett and Gandalf yes. and Elrond yes, the, to freak the, out. Yeah, the Morgul blade. That yes. Morgul blade yes. allegedly was supposed to be the same one that stabs Frodo in the Fellowship of the Ring. But yeah. how could that blade possibly have gotten into the hands of Radagast and Gandalf mm -hmm. and then from Rivendell get into the Witch King's hands again to be used 60 years later against Frodo? That was a little piece uh. of a thread that I couldn't figure out. Have you any ideas? Nope. Me neither. All right. No. Never mind. The trip to maybe, Moria. When those dwarves go to Moria. Maybe that's one for one of those fill-in films. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In the go. mean and in the meantime, we have another trilogy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. In between the trilogy. Well, I would like to see the young Aragorn and Legolas yeah. movie where they meet yeah. each other and become buddies yep. and have some strange adventures like hunting yeah. for Gollum. I'm sure that's the movie. I'd I'm like sure to see. there's enough background from the books that they there can is. do something like there that. Is. There Question, is. Question, yeah. uh, is there any significance for the holes in the handle? These. Uh, Narsil. Narsil. Um, is that, is, and is, there, is right that a Tolkien reference or is no, that a historic reference? Neither, really. The, the sword is basically a, a classic medieval sword that's called a cruciform style because simply it looks like a cross if you hold it up with yep. the pommel up. Cruciform. Yep. Um, yep. But these are really decorative. Yeah. Um, and in the end, it's because John Howe designed it that way. Mm -hmm. And Peter said, I like that one. <laughs> I like that one. There you go. <laughs> but, That's why. But I've always loved this sword because it's a classic sword, and yet it's quite different. It's, you know, that's one of those things um, about designing stuff. And that I liked about The Lord of the Rings in particular is that there's a, a subtlety to design that is often missed today. Yeah. Can, it's very easy to over-design something because or to not have a fully developed design process because you don't have the time. This is the reforged Flame of the West. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you guys are watching in high def. Mm -hmm. If you're watching in 720p, I'm, v I'm getting some glint and <laughs> gleam of yeah. beautiful reforged steel. Mm -hmm. The Elven Smiths certainly didn't yes. know what they were doing, yep. didn't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Did you find that, uh, John Howe obviously uh, designed these mm -hmm. swords, did you find that certain artists were easier to manufacture or no, e easier really. to, to, John, to build or, or were they just all e John and okay you know how John and Alan started initially at Weta Workshop along with the Weta Workshop designers mm -hmm. so even though a lot of designers worked on sword designs John Howell's stamp is pretty much on everything that he would he would look at the designs and 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 I guess he's helped them refine them yeah, and what happened was that because John Howe was also a medieval reenactor at the time, he made sure that the proportions and looks of the swords were things that, when they were made, they would actually work as swords. And of course, that made my job easier. Yeah, because I'm a props maker, but I make a sword as a sword, mm -hmm. not as a prop. And so it, it makes it a lot easier if I can pick up, see a design, and immediately know, okay, I can see that sword is going to be a good weight and a good balance. And of course, that's good for the actors too because. Mm -hmm. The worst thing you do is give an actor a sword that is trying to break their wrist all the time, and they'll say, "Look, I know it's only for beauty shots, but it's too damn heavy. Give mm -hmm. me one of the uh, aluminium ones." Yeah, that could happen. But by making yeah. the swords a good weight and balance, the actors were happier with them. People are saying, "Oh, wow, that sword!" I just held up the sword <laughs> for just a few seconds, and people yeah. in the chat room are going, "Wow, can I have that? It looks yeah. amazing." Now, tell mm -hmm. me, what was one of your very favorite designs to work on? You're holding it. This is it. Yes, Anduril. Anduril, Anduril is it for me. And I heard and someone you had to make it a few different ways. And you had to make yeah. it different ways. <laughs> yeah. I heard someone say in the uh, uh, in the uh, you call it the interrogation, but it's the director's commentary <laughs> <Yes>. track. <laughs> really, it's not an interrogation. When when the director was saying in the uh, Return of the King commentary mm -hmm. track, he mm -hmm. said, "You see these Elven Smiths and the way they're hammering and hammering yeah. that. That is not exactly the way." He said, "It looks yeah. good." Mm. But it's yeah. not exactly the way you would reforge no, a piece like this. Isn't. Can you tell us a little bit about the technical aspect of reforging okay. this well, baby? Okay, if I had a sword like this with all these fragments to yeah. reforge it... We you, can go ahead and show the people You can't really just put the ends together and hammer it yeah. because they won't bond properly. Mm. So you'll end up with a weak sword. So uh, what you'd have to do would be to stack all those bits together, hammer them, heat them, hammer them back into a solid block, 
Mm. Add more material because you're going to lose some from what's called scale as uh -huh. you're working it. Right. Then you draw it out into a new sword blade. So a little bit more complicated than what the film shows. Okay, understood. But of course, in the film, if you did what's technically correct, it would still look odd to a lot of people. Whereas yeah. put two bits together, hit them with a hammer, sparks fly, people can uh, understand that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so that, that's creative liberties. Yeah. We were talking about uh, uh, you know uh, innovations in, in metallurgy mm. long time ago. Have are, yeah. have, the, have there been any uh, any new developments? Uh, there are still some happening. Are we going to get to a point where uh, aluminium is uh, as strong as this or Never. anything? Th this is one of those topics that I could go on for hours. But you know, people talk about you know you've been making steel swords around the world for. A couple of thousand years surely there's a better material now but the reality is that there isn't um, the properties that what you need to get for a sword blade there is no better combination than a carbon steel and in fact it's very close to um, a modern spring steel in composition ah. as your ideal blade steel because it's got to it's got to be strong when you make a long blade you don't want it to hit something and then the forces to overstress it and snap it it's got to hold a reasonable edge, but it doesn't have to be a knife edge or a scalpel edge, right? Um, because it's also going to get hitting uh, hit hard things like armor that would just shatter a really refined edge. Yes. Um, other materials like aluminium are lighter, of course, but you've got to make them thicker. And the things that make a sword cut really well are that it's thin, mm -hmm. and that's the property of steel. Mm. So titanium and aluminium both have things about them that wouldn't make good sword blades ever. Ah, uh, uh, understood. The same with carbon fiber. People have talked about all yeah. these things in science fiction and stuff, but uh, yeah, the reality is that spring steel is still the best steel. Until they start inventing how, you know, inventing swords that are made of light. When that yeah. happens, we'll have a whole nother conversation about yes. that technology, it, right? Yeah. It, <laughs> is there a purpose for swords moving forward mm. now and moving forward in society when you know they're not they're not daily weapons i mean everything yeah. is you know swords now are just for mm -hmm. props and for yeah. you know um, recreation the reality is swords are obsolete weapons mm -hmm. and we've just got to accept that mm -hmm. uh you'd have to be crazy to take a sword into a gunfight you know, yeah that's the mo that's the modern reality but what it does and this is the thing that i love is that it frees us up as storytellers because the sword is no longer a weapon that people understand in, on a day-to-day -day sense. Mm. The, right. the, the, the place of the sword today really is as a storytelling device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a very powerful one. And yep. I, I, there's something about the power of swords mm. and the fact that you take a gun, put it in a character's mm. hand, yep. it gives a character too much power. Yeah. Put a sword in a character's hand, mm. and that individual is still responsible for yeah. his or her own... Yeah strengths, yeah. limitations, yes. and it brings it much mm. much more down yeah. to a, a relatable yeah. level. The, the sword you know. is a powerful tool, but it's a, a tool that's only as good as the ability of the person using it. Mm -hmm. So if you give a sword to somebody yep. who's a skilled sword fighter, it is a, a powerful weapon. To some, In somebody else's hands, it's still a dangerous weapon, but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily one that they can use properly. Mm. Yes. Well, it's a good thing that Star Wars blasts mm. from blaster guns yeah move at a speed far slower than bullets do because it has allowed all of our Jedi for many, many, many years to do the one thing that we've always thought. Well, yeah. I can actually use a sword against a projectile mm -hmm. yes. firearm and have mm -hmm. it work quite well. Mm -hmm. But this, that's just all part of the storytelling, yeah. Yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. but um, Scott has a continuity question. He does. Yeah. He says, sure. uh, uh, I, I, a sting question from Hobbit, uh, An yes. Unexpected Journey. We, why was the Elvish script missing from the sword from Sting when Ian Holm opened the chest uh, to grab the red book? But when he uh, g gives the Sting to Frodo in Rivendell, the script was on it. Did Was okay. there a, so a version without the script? Yes, and that's a really interesting question because it's one that I've actually thought about myself after seeing the films. And it's a well-spotted continuity error, as far as I can tell. Yes. Because the... The backstory is that in The Hobbit, the, okay, the script that is on Sting that you see in Lord of the Rings translates roughly to, my name is Sting, I am the spider's bane. Yes. And of course, until the adventures in Riven, uh, in, uh, against the giant spiders in Mirkwood, mm. it couldn't be there. 
That's right. Oh, so, so the backstory really? the backstory that was that Peter Jackson thought of for this is that the elves added that script to the blade and the handguard after the events of the Hobbit. Yes. And and so and so yes, I did see that scene where where that sword and also the scabbard that you're holding there that has all this lovely uh, highlighted detail on it. Those are smooth panels in the Hobbit version of Sting as well. Ah, so, really? so again, the elves added that, uh, uh, presumably uh, during Bilbo's return home, he stopped at Rivendell and they did all this to celebrate what he'd done. But yes, I, I did spot that continuity thing and I'm pretty sure it is a continuity issue because I thought, yeah, that, but that, that's, makes that sense. shouldn't be the sword that you pull out at the beginning of the movie when it is actually meant to be 60 years later. But it, it oh, doesn't make sense. It, right, it kind of makes right. sense. It should be this one he pulls out, not the one that... Oh, you're right. That That's right. Is That's right. Simple because in that story, he would have gone back to Rivendell yes. on his way home from mm. Erebor. And yes. of course, Elrond had a fast friendship with Bilbo mm. and mm. encouraged yeah. Bilbo to stay in Rivendell with yes. him. So of course, everyone would have said, mm. your little blade mm. has had such adventures, yes. Mr. Baggins. Yep. Let us do something for mm. you. And the elves yeah. probably graciously said, yeah. let us make this ornamentation mm -hmm. and yep. give your letter opener yes. a proper name. <laughs> Which means yes. there's probably footage of that shot somewhere mm. Mm. Probably. Hopefully. I'm thinking it's probably in there. Yeah. But um, I love all those bits. I love all yeah. those little bits that mm. fans find continuity yes. errors. Yeah. That's how involved we are as fans. Yes. Yeah. That's why and we I'd know what we're talking about. I'd love to say that there are no continuity, continuity errors, but of course we know that there are. Hey, uh, Just a few. A little, little factoid here. Uh, I remember reading uh, somebody, somebody who was obviously uh, quite enthusiastic spotted all the the continuity errors in Lord of the Rings after yeah. the films got released. They came up with, I think it was 120 odd over yeah. the three films. Yeah. Now at the same time when Spider-Man came out, I think they the, the same person or same group found 300 odd. So I, I actually took that as a compliment oh, yeah. to, to Lord of the Rings that actually, considering that you're making three films simultaneously mm -hmm. all over the place and then editing it all together and doing all this other post-production work, that number of continuity errors Assuming that they all were errors and not just things that were meant to look a certain way. Right. It's actually not bad. That's yeah. great. Scott, Scott actually yeah. came up with his That's own great. theory yeah. of, of Sting. Mm. Bilbo goes to Rivendell ahead yes. of Frodo. Uh, <laughs> and, and then yeah. they meet up later. So Bilbo like gets this inscribed yeah. while and he's then in hands Rivendell. It over. And then when, when, when Frodo shows up with Gandalf... It's that's oh, when it, it happens. Be. Maybe Bilbo gets it inscribed after his 111th birthday party and after mm -hmm. he leaves the Shire, right, for the last time. So, oh, that, you know, yeah. it, uh, back I'd to, like to think on that one. Back to that's the, a bit. The that, there's a bit there. Okay. <laughs> did, did they give you the the design script and and, and you yep. design that? How how much creative freedom do you actually have? Um, well, I'm given the designs for all of these, so about my only input to the design process is sometimes I'll talk to the designers uh, if they've got a, a something they're stuck on, trying to get a design that works. Um, a good example being the script on Anduril is that they'd, they'd been trying to design all sorts of things where they had like a block of script here and I, and and different sized swords and I, and I actually just suggested them, well hang on, it's a, king, a king's sword how about making it a two-handed sword? So make it big, mm -hmm. and if you spread all your script out into one long line in the middle of the fuller, it's all really readable. So mm -hmm. this was this was about also making it readable for people on screen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah, it's one of those times where actually an idea of mine really helped the design process. Usually I'm given a finished design, mm -hmm. and my job is to take a two-dimensional drawing and turn it into a working three-dimensional object. That is such a challenge. And does, yeah, such a challenge. How many versions yeah. of each sword do you have to make during production? It depends on it depends on how they're going to be used. Okay, something like Narsal or Andril, I think I made two of each. Mm -hmm. And what that was about, that, that meant that they could be shooting on two sets simultaneously, that they wouldn't be forced to schedule according to the props, that mm -hmm. the props would be there as needed. Right. Um, Sting is a good example of one that I made a lot of because there were like two, two hero stings... Uh, in two different scales mm -hmm. and then you had about four or five aluminium bladed stunt versions and then there were other versions like a soft version for riding a horse so if you fall you don't skewer yourself and all this right. stuff. It actually worked out I think I probably 
there were probably about 20 different versions of the Sting Sword that you see in the movie. Between wow. hero, stunt, scale, special wow. purposes. Well, the people in the chat room are saying that Legolas's knives, mm -hmm. there were a lot, it seems like there are a lot of different versions of his knives. Yep. Like, the handles yep. are always changing color okay. movie to movie. Oh, that, that's not the knives. I think what that is is color grading, probably. Okay. Because the, the knives were the knives. Hmm. Now, maybe the wood might have darkened a bit over time. It was sealed under resin, but woods do change color as they age. Sometimes they bleach, sometimes they darken. But most likely what you're seeing in the films is that because they did this um, process of, they filmed on 35 millimeter, scanned it, digitized it, did all the digital work, put it back onto film, but there was also color grading and mm -hmm. tweaking this mm -hmm. and that. So chances are what you actually just see is that they've like done a, a grading pass on a particular shot and it's changed the things that you think should mm -hmm. look a certain way like sword handles, but your overall colors are more what Peter wanted for that scene. The only thing I would like to see corrected in any future, mm -hmm. whatever that ultimate yeah. unicorn edition <laughs> might be that comes out, I would like to see that the glowing uh, color of Sting yes. between the six movies mm -hmm. would match a little bit more. Really? It seems that early Sting that mm -hmm. Martin Freeman has yep. is very, very, very bright. Mm -hmm. And the Sting glowing that Frodo discovers in the Minds of Moria mm -hmm. sequence yep. is, is different. It's just noticeably different. Okay. Maybe and it's wearing off. Maybe. Because they engraved it. <laughs> because they engraved it. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, what else yeah. do we have here? Let's talk about some of this. Because yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of the yeah. Rohan culture. Oh, yes. Big yeah. fan of the Rohan culture. And one of the biggest moments that exemplifies why we romanticize mm. swords, mm -hmm. and they're such an important part of the storytelling, is because Gandalf uses this actual line of dialogue. Your hands might feel better if they gripped mm -hmm. your sword. And it's not yeah. just a symbolic mm -hmm. gesture. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it is. It is a symbolic gesture. It's also a spiritual one, mm -hmm. where Theoden yeah. is becoming mm -hmm. reconnected with himself. Yes. And they knew that there were going to be all these beautiful close-ups mm -hmm. of that moment. Yes. And you knew this was one of the mm -hmm. designs you'd have to work yeah. on hardest, right? Am I right Pretty in much. saying that? It's because it's yeah. my, one of my favorites. Look at yeah. this. This horse head design, mm -hmm. you guys are very familiar with the double mm -hmm. horse head. This is the pommel, right? Uh, is this no? Oh, that's the handguard. The, the handguard. down here. The pommel yeah. is down here at this end. Wait. Excuse me. Yep. Technical terms. <laughs> deep, deep cuts with Peter Lyon <laughs> on the one ring.net. Yep. And tell me about this, because this is one of the most yes. gorgeous things I've ever mm -hmm. seen. You guys, it's beautiful. What yep. do you think of this? I actually, okay, I've got to admit here, I actually don't like this as much as some of the other Rohan swords mm -hmm. because this is a, on the, the hero sword, this is a huge lump of bronze mm. and it makes the sword really heavy. Yes, it does. Weighs, the sword weighs about four pounds in the, the hero version in the film. Yeah. Um, it's, it should be about three pounds, for, ideally for a, for a fighting sword. Yes. But there's a huge lump of bronze there. It's a very beautiful lump of bronze. Yes, <laughs> yes it is. But uh, I actually do prefer uh, Eowyn's sword and particularly Eomer's sword. Yeah. Because the way that they do the, the horse head designs on those just mm. works artistically as well in a, in a very beautiful way. We were this close to having Eowyn's sword physically this here with us. This is on it. The Noble Collection. We were this close to having it. Well, Amelia was going to bring there's it. A, uh, yeah. There's been there's uh, been a lot of requests for Aomer's sword. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would love to do that. Uh, you mean as a limited edition collectible? Yeah. Yes. Well, I haven't done a Rohan sword for the limited edition. Really? Yet. Now, Theoden's sword is an obvious one because it gets a lot of screen time. But mm -hmm. I do love Eowyn's sword, and I particularly like Eomer's sword because the way those those two horse heads on the cross guard just curve around opposite sides of the blade mm -hmm. that's a really beautiful subtle mm -hmm. bit of design there that's and did, cool. did you have any input on that or did that no, all come not from on the that art? no and the, the bronzes i didn't have much to do with except for fitting them to the sword mm -hmm. and doing the finishing work <coughs> because they were sculpted mm -hmm. by one of our, our lead sculptors and then uh, made in wax and sent off to be cast in bronze when you were at the heyday of making all these mm -hmm. blades for mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings, what was the maximum number of staff and uh, you know support you had with you, <laughs> or was it really um, you, just yourself? You know, it was pretty much me. Oh uh, my gosh! Yeah. Okay. Wow. Wow. There, there were three of us working in in my area. Yeah. And uh, two of the others were specialist armorers, 
and I actually said to Richard Taylor one day, well, look, you've got two specialist armourers. I'm doing swords and armour. I'd actually be quite happy if you just gave me all the sword stuff in future and let mm-hmm. your specialist armourers do the armouring. Yeah. And so sure. that's how I became a specialist sword maker. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Just like that. Luis says uh, muse- the museum line mm-hmm. versions. Yeah. There's a Sam's ones there. This is this is Sam's blade. Yeah, full this pang, is museum line. Yeah, full no, so, versions. So what what what's the difference here? I like this one. This has got a lot of texture uh, and it's sharp, sharper than the yeah. others. It's, it's weathered. That's the it's difference. weathered. Um, yeah. But what what is that? Mm-hmm. Is the museum line? Is that what, what brand is that? United Cutlery. That's United okay. Cutlery. Okay. I, I actually cutlery. haven't haven't handled many of the museum line, or if I have, I I haven't known it. Mm-hmm. So I'm not actually all too clear on what the difference is, except that I think they're meant to be a little bit better finished overall. Yeah. Well, so here you are. You've got you've got the museum line, United mm-hmm. Cutlery. Yeah. How does this compare to what you remember of Sam's sword? That's right, Jason Creed. Get back, you devils! <laughs> that's the, that's exactly yeah. the bit. That's right, Jason. Yeah, we we get yeah. the live chatters nice sword. supporting us here. I now, did I did actually like these swords because they were so beat up. Mm-hmm. And yet there were some really nice little design things in them. Um, like, for example, I can't remember whether it's Frodo. The sword, One of the swords is a, a straight copy of a 13th century Holbein dagger, which uh, is a European dagger. Yeah. And it, but it was just right for the film. So mm-hmm. it, it was one that Peter approved. But these are, yeah, I did really like these swords because they're, they have nice, simple designs but they've had a very hard life, obviously. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, when, yeah. now, when you're you're holding mm. that, what, yeah. what 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 are you acknowledging when you say this is a nice made sword? Um. Okay. Well, I'm looking at things like line and form. So what I'm seeing is that there are you know the ridge lines are nice and crisp. Everything looks fairly symmetrical, um, and these are things that are hard to achieve when you're trying to make. 500 or 1,000 or whatever yeah, like mass, mass, pr- production, mass production yeah. swords to meet a, a price point. And, you know, and the hilt, these will be uh, zinc alloy castings and other details added, but even within that, they're actually quite nicely executed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, what, what, makes, what, what makes something mm. like this uh, produced in mass quantities, or yeah. 500 pieces mm-hmm. or 1,000, yeah. what makes it difficult? I think that ultimately it's the price point. If you if price was no object, you could make every sword beautifully, but ah yes, but it's all about price. Yes, uh, and, yes. and because you're trying to figure yes. out the mass market, what will the the mass market buyers willingly pay? Say it's two hundred or two hundred and fifty dollars, mm. then you've got to work out okay if that's our retail, what's our wholesale, what's our manufacturing and shipping it all it all comes down to and what's so all what, those nasty little business conversations unfortunately yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah what what influences the price is it, is it the yeah. number of hours uh, a person can put toward is it the type of metals that you're sourcing or the, the um, quality of the uh, where yeah, what influences that price? a lot of it is time so of course these are manufactured in china your labor costs are lower uh these are all made out of 420 stainless steel Straight away, you don't have to worry about rust. Mm-hmm. Uh, 420s are, are reasonably easy steel to work with. Mm-hmm. The ones I work with tend to be a little bit finicky. They tend to warp and heat treatment and things like that. So they take a bit more work to straighten them out afterwards sometimes. But what they do produce is a sword that, if you went into battle, if anyone did still go into battle with swords, that would be a sword that you could trust your life to. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the irony today is that you don't need to trust your life to a sword in battle. Yes. Mm. But that doesn't yes. mean that we shouldn't make swords like that occasionally. Yeah. Well, I hear you on that. <laughs> now, we, had, we had a question uh, come in on the text message. Would, now, now going into the, the themes of Tolkien, yeah. uh, would uh, a sword from the first age mm-hmm. to the third age, mm-hmm. would it actually remain that sharp and that not mm-hmm. rusted? That's an interesting one too. It's about the, seven thousand years of time. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had this these sorts of conversations too. It's like it's seven thousand years old, but it's elven. So what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's elven. Yes. Yes. I love um, it. I love so it. so like yeah, we assume that they were the elves had some very special steels that sure they aged a bit, but they didn't age the way that 
a normal steel like a human made sword would have aged. Right. Like the King of the Army of the Dead is a good example of that. Oh. This sword's only two thousand years old and it's got holes in it. Yeah. Yes, it does. Now, is is there yeah. any real reality basis to an elven steel? You know, a, a specialized um, steel. Maybe they possibly. Uh, and would that come from manufacturing pro mm -hmm. processes or just access to well, unique materials? Well, you have to make an analogy between mm -hmm. where Tolkien was putting his yeah. history and where we yeah. were in our history of sword development. Yeah. Uh, and we've got to assume too that the swords, are, the the elves, are the ultimate at whatever they do because. They have all the time in the world to mm -hmm. make it perfect. Mm -hmm. There are special steels being manufactured today that that are superior to any of the old steels. There are things like powdered steels that get rid of any inconsistencies. There are some other special steels that need very, very special heat treatment. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you just won't get the performance out of them. Well, so there are there are steels that will perform closer to that absolute optimum than you can expect with a, a mass manufactured steel, for example. Well, if Feanor can mm. make three Silmarils, yeah. then I think he and his kin mm -hmm. could figure out yeah. how to make certain yeah. alloys mm. work in a certain what way. What was the sword, what was <laughs> the predecessor <laughs> to Arendil's mm. sword? What, what was that, what, the first sword? Erindil. No, oh, El be before that, there were the, the, the sword, who, who was Nar it? Narsil belonged to Erindil. And then Isildur took the sword from his father, because mm -hmm. his father was dying on the field, but right? Then, wasn't yes. there another so, sword mm. that... Erendil had? No. Er er Erendil had Narsil. He yeah. had the king's yeah. blade. Mm. This beautiful example of a sword, which is probably mm. the next thing we should yes. show the audience. Oh, this one. Is, yeah, this is actually Isildur's yes. sword. And it's a sword that I wish had been seen a bit more in the films because it's just a nice design. Look at this. Yeah, yeah let's show the folks at home. It's just I'll really, really oh, beautiful. This one's quite hefty, too. <laughs> it is quite like hefty. It's not sharp. <laughs> Some of these are sharp, some of these are... Yeah, that's one thing I never quite understood is why did United Cutlery do some very blunt and some that were actually quite sharp? Do you think that has to do with uh, the limited editions and the price points? I'm not sure. Maybe. Maybe the Master Collection were the sharper ones. Does it take more effort to make a sharp sword? A little bit, but not much. As, okay. long, as, the, as long as my final grinds before I sharpen are all a consistent thickness, mm -hmm. um, sharp or blunt isn't much difference in work. A little bit more for sharp because I've got to be quite careful that yeah. I don't end up overdoing it and end up with this wavy edge. But yeah, uh, yeah, not Na a lot of difference. Na Nathaniel in Chatham says the museum collection is the higher end of United yes. Cutlery, mm -hmm. so they would be sharp. Yep. Oh, I see mm -hmm. it. That explains yep. that. We're we'll very careful mm -hmm. here, everybody. <laughs> the elegance of this yes. design. Uh, this is Numenorean. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's, this is why this Numenorean flavor yes. is also seen, mm -hmm. perhaps from. You know, your conversations with Daniel Falconer mm. or mm -hmm. the other artists yes. from Weta, they probably thought these are Numenorean mm. elements and we'll have yeah. them consistent mm -hmm. in yeah. these people because they are Numenoreans, yep. even though they've relocated mm. Gondor, mm -hmm. but they're, yeah. you know, they're in exile yep. from the sunken mm -hmm. island. That was yeah. the Atlantis myth that yeah. Tolkien had. Uh, I'm glad you grabbed this one too because this is one that I did have a bit of input design on. Yeah. Mm. So things like the way that grip swells and mm -hmm. that little ridge line that goes into the ridge line on the pommel as well. Yes. All those are things that I was a able to take a basic grip design that was in the original design and think, well, we can do a little bit more with this, I think. Yeah. Especially because it was all going to be covered with this uh, interwoven leather. There was an observant yeah. chatter. She was just saying, I don't mind having a heavy, heavy pommel at yes. the base of my Rohan sword. Yeah. Because she said, I could use this as a blunt instrument yes. to back end somebody who's yes. with me in close combat. Yeah. I saw that, that comment was, in the chat. But yeah. that, that was actually part of medieval combat techniques. So, well, uh, the whole frame, yeah. the whole term pummeling comes from pommel. Hmm. Oh, wow. There you go. Yeah. Yay! Yeah, sword. Now, mm -hmm. was just love this. I love this. This is, is Isildur's sword. Is there a class decision, a, a, a delineation between a, just a wood handle and a mm -hmm. leather handle? I mean, what mm -hmm. what what makes you determine what material to put on the handle? Uh, the design, essentially. Hmm. But it was nice to have a variety of designs. So some of the ones, uh, you know, like for example, Aragorn's hunting knife, that was Cocobolo wood originally. So, and Coca Bolo is a very hard waxy wood, it polishes up really nicely. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice surface in itself. Other ones, leather seemed more appropriate for the overall design, mm -hmm. or maybe the, the culture that was using it. Uh, other possibilities were wire, yeah. a wire wrap. 
Well, so, so there's a few materials available. I've learned a bit about samurai culture because mm -hmm. I also have an. Uh, not only do I have an affection for, mm -hmm. you know, English and Anglophile culture, but they had uh, a period of time where it was quite common for the samurai warriors to have wooden armor, mm -hmm. wooden plate armor. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine why. Why? Why would wooden armor be developed over a period of time when a mm -hmm. class of weapons such as these could mm -hmm. easily shatter or pierce through, you know? The design of it. I just find mm. that fascinating to me. Um, w yeah. Is it is it also true that as time went on, different advancements in mm -hmm. metallurgy and, and the availability of different mm -hmm. armor designs influenced the way that the weapons were also oh, evolved? There, there was always an arms race going on. Always an arms race. And every culture yeah. had their own arms race. So just because they developed plate steel armor in Europe in the late Middle Ages, mm. the Japanese didn't do that until they encounter until they had meetings with. Europeans who introduced yeah. this armor to Japan, and then it right. became a popular style there. Right. You always got to remember that it's not all about function; that fashion does play a part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, yeah. You know, there are some really freaky European armors that, uh, you know, there was a period in the 16th century where people wore this these extravagant puffed and slashed clothes, mm -hmm. and some people made armors to emulate that as well. Oh. Not for necessarily for the battlefield, but for show. Mm -hmm. But really? they still did it. Really? Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. And sometimes it was just a case of, I've got the money and because I can. Because <laughs> essentially, you know, you know the story. It, yeah. happen, it happens every culture, every period in time. Yeah. There's always somebody who says, nobody's done that before. I'll pay for that. Speaking of a big pommel, oh, yes. this is Boromir sword, yes, is it not? That is. This is a This is a design we do not see mm. very much of. No. And it's really, really beautiful. It is. Um, I love Boromir's shield. It's very recognizable. The shield is iconic. But his sword, we don't get to see the close-up details so much mm. in Fellowship. No. It's, well, it's not a complicated sword. No, there's it, not It's a like light. Boromir. He's, to put it politely, he's not a complicated person. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Fair uh, enough. He's a warrior. He's, he's, yes. he's a manly man, and he's carrying a sword that is broad and heavy, and it's a, obvious a slashing and thrusting weapon. Yes. And for me, the challenge was, I knew the blade was going to be heavy, mm -hmm. and I was fortunate that the design had a large pommel, which, when it was made in steel, worked out really nicely to turn that sword into a well-balanced but heavy sword. Yes. So you can, you can have a sword that's lightweight, but if it's badly balanced, it feels awful. Mm -hmm. And yet a heavy sword can feel good if it's balanced right and the dynamics are right. Right. Again, not that it matters because they're not actually fighting, but is every things sword I like balanced? Uh, every sword in Lord of the Rings balanced? No. Really? Look at the Urukai weapons. They're oh, not no, balanced. Oh, they're different. Yeah. yeah. But that's they're they're meant to be brutal. Yeah. And ugly. But all the things like the human weapons and the dwarven weapons to a degree, particularly the elven weapons, they're all meant to have an elegance to them. Mm -hmm. And if it's a functional elegance. Mm -hmm. And part of that is the weight, the balance, the things that I work on. How close did you get to actually making some of those uglier, like orc blades and axes? Uh, you didn't get um, into the axe world not, as much. Not the axes. They were yeah. mostly cast aluminium. Yeah. But there were, I did make some of the prototypes, at least for the uh, things like the Uruk swords. Mm -hmm. Funny story here. One of the very first swords I worked on was the Urukai Berserker two-hander sword. And, you know, that's a huge thing. You know, with that T-shaped tip that's yep. just designed for smacking people yep. both ways. So brutal. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to show you how green I was to the film industry, Richard Taylor says to me, <coughs> I want this to be real. So so I made him a real steel Urukai sword this thick. Oh, no. Out of steel. No. And I forged it. And I split the ends and I forged them out and I formed those tips and, yeah. and I hammered the... Hammer worked the whole surface hot to get that crude look. Yeah. And it was beautiful, but it, it was a lot of work and it was insanely heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as I know, that's still floating around somewhere. Oh, gosh. Hey. But, but it's a wonderful piece of work. I could never actually lift a piece of metal that heavy. Hopefully, one of our friends at Weta will Instagram that picture. Hopefully, yeah. someone at Weta will watch mm. our show because we know you wonderful people down there in. New Zealander watching. <laughs> hey, get, get that Instagram account going and show yeah, us some of those it's, it's secret someone, swords. It's probably in one of those one of those uh, containers somewhere. Yeah, la label. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Scott there. Weir has a question on the live Facebook chat, and thank oh. you all of our Facebook audience for joining us again tonight. Did the hero version of Glamdream have a real sapphire gem set on it? 
And we're going to produce this glam drink right now. Yep. It's the one thing that we haven't picked up off the table yet. Mm. Well, also Orchrist is waiting. <laughs> but you got to get to glam drink and Orchrist yeah. eventually. Okay. Um, Look at this. The replica ones had... Uh, okay, so the high-end replica ones did have an artificial sapphire put in. Uh-huh. But the ones that went on the film set, yes. we cheated. Yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, that was done uh, with a drop of blue resin. Mm. Oh, a drop of blue resin. Yes. Ah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it oh, worked blue, well enough yeah. that yeah, it's nobody... Yeah, sapphire blue. I, I've never actually heard anyone, except they will after this, of course, yeah. comment about <laughs> how it wasn't a sapphire. Yeah. But, it, but it was actually a drop of blue resin because we couldn't find the, the stones that would have fitted the, into the shape. Yes. Uh, they just weren't available. Mm -hmm. And so we had to fall back on plan B, which was blue resin. Did you, working on The Hobbit... And with Gandalf getting mm -hmm. that very close-up shot of him yes. discovering uh, mm -hmm. Glamdring yes. in the Troll Horde, did you have to remake an entire new Glamdring, or did, did you use the one from 16 years ago? No, we, we, we made new ones. So new okay. stings, obviously, but new Glamdring, and of course Orcrist was new. Yes. But yes, new Glamdring, and uh, I also had to make a new Morgul dagger, because yeah. of course it was 60 years younger. It hadn't been thrown into a, a, a barrow to... You know, to decay for mm -hmm. 60 years. So yes. uh, you, it's a lot easier to make swords older than it is to start making them look younger again. Did you yes. find any, uh, you, you yourself find it, uh, as you're recreating swords from the mm -hmm. original trilogy 15 years ago, like, mm -hmm. oh, I've, I always wanted to change that aspect of yeah. it. Now I can. Oh, there's quite a bit of that. I I look at this, the, war, the swords I was doing 16 plus years ago, and, and I just think, I wish I could have done it better. Because yeah, they, that was the limit of my skill at the time, but obviously I've learned a lot since then, mm. and I'm always refining skills and trying to learn new things. And uh, the replicas, and and the ones like the glam drink I made for the Hobbit was uh, just a much better sword. You probably won't notice it. It's little things like the crossguard arms are exactly the same length rather than being a little bit out, and you know the blade is has got the right weight and flex just the way the way it should be mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i've just got my grinds a little bit better there are, there are things that you don't appreciate visually but there are things that i wanted to get right and oh. and, and, the, and this co the the collections the limited collections mm. that you do yeah. for for the workshop mm -hmm. uh allow you to yeah make those they, they, they let me yeah they let me do that and because i'm doing the same sword a few times I'm actually able to, on each one to just think, okay, I want to do this a little bit better or a little bit quicker or, 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 you know, or just things that on a previous one that weren't quite perfect. Okay, I'm obsessive and I don't mind admitting it and I'm a perfectionist. That's why Peter hired you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's my great strength and it's my great weakness. Uh, <laughs> why, why, any artist will say that. Any artist will say that. I so, love that. Someone rescued me on Instagram. They, they responded, uh, had a fang. Uh, there's yeah. a sword uh, called yeah. Arwen's sword. Yes. Is that that's Arwen's sword? Yes. Yep. Yep. It's also Elrond's sword. Hathing. Yeah. Yes. And yes. and El Elrond inherited from some yep. someone older. Mm -hmm. So and, you, and then you Arwen actually made that. It. Yes, I made that as well. And that is a beautiful sword. Um, it's one that I would like to make as a limited edition for one day too. But that and especially the scabbard, trying to make that scabbard in real materials would be an insane amount of work. Uh, so we'll yeah. keep thinking on that one for a while. I why suspect. don't uh, this goes to a couple of questions we've seen yep. today? Why doesn't United Cutlery and some of these others make the scabbards? It's a good question. Uh, you probably have to ask United Cutlery. Is it is it a lot of work? Is it as much work scabbards, as the sword? Uh, yes, yeah, scabbards can be more work than the sword that goes in them sometimes mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. yeah scabbard especially when you add in the belt if the belt is complex as well so a scabbard on its own not so bad but add a belt and it can be as much work as the sword that goes in it yeah it's a uh, it's something that a lot of people don't appreciate because often you, you see the sword uh, the sword is it and the scabbard is an afterthought but when you're building it it's not and uh, how many? How many did you make scabbards for all the swords in the movie? Uh, I didn't actually make all the most of the scabbards myself. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a, this is a great part of the collaboration process that we had specialist leather workers who would do the leather work for grips and scabbards. That's what this is. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And somebody else at the workshop made the uh, Kevlar cores for the scabbards, which was a way of keeping them really, really 
thin and skin tight on the swords. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, generally with the metal work I did that and a lot of the final finishing I was involved with. But yeah, I can't take credit for all of it, of course. And when they come to you with these designs, do you feed back to them like, I think th this, it should, that sword should be this metal, uh, and here's why? It, are there any decisions, or is this all made, it's, are all these made the same way? It's, well, by the time I get a design, those major decisions are all locked in because. They choose th the metal. This is, well, this is, it's not so much they choose it. They've gone through this iterative design process, and Peter Jackson has refined this process and finally signed off on a design. And so I've got to tr stay true to that design. What I try to do is sort of what I, I, th I would call it, say, added value, and make that as the best sword that I can of that design. But it's still got to be given to Peter Jackson, and he's got to know that that sword is the design that he uh, approved. And he has got such a memory and such an eye for detail that he will know if it's not what he approved. Hmm. On, on so, each so, part. So, so it's always that thing of how far can I take this to do what I think might improve it without ending up with without producing something which isn't quite the design that I was given. It's uh, uh, it's yeah. always it's a different difficult balancing act and it's one of those things that, that you a judgment that you develop over time, especially when you work for say a, a director like Peter Jackson on projects. Lucian on Facebook is asking in the live chat how mm -hmm. does a sword belt. Hold the sword and scabbard in place. I suppose there's a, vari a variety of different... There, there are lots of ways that it can work. Uh, a lot of it really comes down to is when the sword is in the scabbard or when the scabbard is there without the sword, both times it has to balance. So you've got to remember that if you take a scabbard like this, for example, if there's no sword in it, it's balancing here. Mm -hmm. But if you put a sword in it, the balance goes to here. Mm. And the way it's suspended has to support support it with both of those balances mm -hmm. you don't want to pull the sword out and have your scabbard go <laughs> like that <laughs> embarrassing yeah. um, <laughs> so there, there, there are these little details and of course because John Howe was so heavily involved with that as well he made sure that that sort of thing worked yeah. which is something that it's a bit of a trap for the unwary when it comes to designing stuff mm -hmm. that you know you'd come up with this beautiful design and then somebody like me comes along and says but it won't work. Oh, <laughs> to be a fly on the wall for those oh, yeah. conversations. <laughs> How many times did you have to send designs back and say, let's talk about the feasibility of this um, being a real instrument? I never really sent them back, but, but there is often this thing of, okay, we've got this design, it's all approved, we're going to make it, but it doesn't work as it is. So what can we do that's the, the least intrusion on that design yeah. to make it work on set? Because, of course, you've got to remember, too, in the end, these are props that go on set. They're going to be strapped on actors who are doing different things, different days, and each, every shot is set up very, very carefully, so you can tweak things. Okay, I get it. Were you, were you responsible for, for exporting the copies uh, that United Colouring mm -hmm. and everybody got? I mean, how do these manufacturing yep. mm -hmm. companies... Um, with, with the United Cutlery Masters, Weta made essentially a stunt sword that was sent to them. So it was uh, an aluminium blade made to the dimensions of the original, and the hilt was a urethane hilt cast on it, just like the, the stunt swords had been done on set. Mm -hmm. And so from that, United Cutlery had a master that they could base their replica on. Mm -hmm. And then they would make decide what compromises they might have to make in order to make this manufacturable. Like, a good example is actually Glamdrum. So if you look at the United Cutlery Sword, right here, you see how the fuller runs under the, the point of the handguard? Yes. On the film Glamdrum, that splits in a sort of a, a forked tongue, like a snake tongue. Oh, I see. Which mm. is fiddly and quite a lot of work, which is okay for a film prop, but not if you're trying to produce 2,000 or whatever of these at an affordable price. Right. So they compromised that to make it manufacturable. Right. Whereas on the film, I had the time to sit there and uh, do all that stuff by hand. So when you get to the master collection where it's like t pieces of 25 and 50, are, mm -hmm. are you making those considerations as well? Or no, with, with no the I'm making them just like the original, but better. Hmm. That's, my, that's my philosophy. The original, but better. But better. 
Yeah. Is it is it are the are the master collection uh, the, like the same metals and the same yes. materials, mm -hmm. or uh, have you since in the fifteen years found new materials that? Uh, generally, they're the same materials. You know, spring steel blades, mild steel for the crosses and pommels, wooden grips, uh, the risers under the grip, cord, leather for the outer. None of those have changed. Bronze castings where there are for things that need bronze. So pretty much all the materials that were used for the hero swords originally are the, the sort of materials you'd use on a real fighting sword and scabbard. And so they just carry through to the uh, to the master swordsmith collection. The the only the only um, compromise really. Which one? The sting, the silver. Oh yeah, the silver inlay on sting. Yeah. I wouldn't call that a compromise. That was more like, literally, when we when we were first doing sting, I did some tests of could I do an inlaid grip, and what I decided was no, not with the current technology and my skill set. So when it came to the Master Swordsmith collection, I, I was actually the one who uh, made my life difficult and said, maybe we can do this. Oh, <laughs> I see. I see now. Yeah. yeah. Did, did anything, and it took a lot of work, but I got there. Did yeah. anything improve besides, besides your skill set for mm -hmm. creating the replicas? I mean, did, did mm -hmm. anything improve between the, Hob the Lord of the Rings 15 years ago and The Hobbit? I, wouldn't, I don't know if you'd say improved, but things have changed. Um, there will never be another film set like The Lord of the Rings because literally the, they don't make films like that anymore mm -hmm. because uh, the the pre-production time is less, everything's tightened up we, we had this luxury of a real development time on Lord of the Rings that is much harder to get now and so the turnaround time is a lot quicker um, and so we and of course, there's a lot more digital work now. The mantra is we can always fix it in post-production. So this thing of, on Lord of the Rings where we tried to have beautiful props all the time, you don't necessarily need to do it today because if it I doesn't see. quite work on the day, you can fix it. Yeah. Of course, it doesn't mean that that's an excuse for poor prop making, but who knows? Of course. Were you involved in Warcraft or any of the other Weta movies? Own, uh, since Lord of the Rings, I've been involved in quite a few. I wasn't really involved in Warcraft because the swords for that were uh, 3D design, uh, CNC'd, the, no. hilts were th the hilts were printed, oh. and then molded. Using made. 3D printers? The hilt, yeah, the hilts were not 3D metal printed. Oh. The hilts on those are actually urethane, but oh. the masters were printed in a, one of the plastics they used. So this is a perfect example of how wow. technologies have changed. Yeah. yeah. Because wow. I didn't need to be involved because the finishing of those aluminium blades was a prop making thing because the shapes were dictated by the games. Oh, yes. And yes, if you imagine okay. those swords done in steel rather than aluminium, they, they would have been fantastically heavy. Yeah. Uh, they, wouldn't, they basically wouldn't have used them. Uh, they would have put them on a table to look at. But um, with an aluminium blade, they're heavy, but they can be used. Mm. Are you, okay. are you uh, are, were you well versed in Tolkien and Lord of the Rings be before you started on this and are there any Silmarillion swords that you just have your eye on like um, oh man okay this is where I need to make a couple of confessions <laughs> I read Lord of the Rings once when I was a kid and I frankly wasn't that impressed with it <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read the Hobbit I, I didn't, so I'm <laughs> I mean yeah um, I reread it once I started work at Weta and realised actually that as an adult, suddenly, yes, there is a lot more there than I picked up as a kid. Uh -huh. The Silmarillion, another little confession is, I got two chapters into the Silmarillion and gave up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's one of those books that I keep reminding myself I've got to read it one day. <laughs> well, it's a when lot they, of... When they pay you to. <laughs> when they pay you to, yeah. No, no, just, just, just so I can say I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people use online study guides mm -hmm. to get through the Silmarillion. It's yeah. that hard of a read, mm -hmm. and it's not a novel. It's like no. a weird listing of histories, and it's yes. it's quite something else entirely. Stinks. Don't don't feel bad about that. Mm. Where, el good. where else do you get uh, inspiration for weapons? I mean, do, do you, you you don't just make mm. weapons for movies. I mean, this mm. must be more than more than a work. Yeah, um, history is actually <laughs> my big thing. Mm -hmm. So I was a sword, sword and armor maker when Weta called me in to, to do Lord of the Rings. Yeah. But my real fascination's always been medieval European history. And because of now working in the film industry, 
I've broadened that quite a bit because it's, I could get a throw, question thrown at me any time about any culture, so it helps to have a little bit of background on everything. For sure. But yeah, h history is the thing that fascinates me. To me too, um, and that's something about why uh, there's a lot of fantasy and a lot of science mm. fiction, but when I read certain writers that deeply, deeply yes. get into their mm. history, yeah. that's why Tolkien is so fascinating to mm. me, because he was so careful about building yes. a very big history. When mm -hmm. I read Frank Herbert yeah. and read about Dune, mm -hmm. that's yes. the science fiction that gets me most interested yeah. mm -hmm. because the history is replete yes. with economic forces, yeah. c mm -hmm. cultural forces that mm -hmm. are moving the yeah. lives of the characters. Mm -hmm. I find that fascinating. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. Um, and Tolkien had the advantage that when he was writing Lord of the Rings, he was so well versed in things like Norse mythology. Mm -hmm. He was actually using rhyme and meter from Norse myth as well as everything else. And the re that, because of the way he wrote it, gives some of that mythological feeling that is often hard, that you often lack with modern writers who write in a very modern way. It's heavy, yeah. isn't it? It is heavy. <laughs> so so this someone is, in the is, chat room was saying, this is heavy. <laughs> yes, this is the one that I, I nicknamed the monster. Or Christ. Or Christ. Now this is, this is the small version, I think. Really? Yes, this is the human scale, Orchrist. Yeah, the, we we had a few questions on the, on Facebook mm. of like, how long is Orchrist supposed to be? Because there's a uh, lot of debate. If I stand up, I could give you an idea. Well, you're six three, right? Six yep. four. Yep. Now, so say that's now the scale ratio was one point two five. So the real Orchrist, well, the Richard Armitage version of Orchrist was about this long. Oh wow! And it weighed about eight pounds, huh. which which may not sound a lot, but you try standing at a grinder for a ten-hour day <laughs> grinding one of those. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty hard on the back. I can imagine. <laughs> but this this scale this so this is the human scale version of Orchrist for people like you and I, and um, that would actually be quite a nice one-handed slicing sword. This um, this is from the United Cutlery, Kyle. Yeah. Okay. And the problem that you also identified, we were talking mm. in the parking yeah. lot, because of this shape, the mm -hmm. scabbard, well, you wouldn't physically, if this was yes. closed, you would not yeah. physically be able to pull the thing yeah. out. Yeah, and so, you see the blade emerge. Yeah, the, it comes right through the slot right there. Yes, and this is all fun and games. Now, <laughs> originally, in the original design, the designers were trying to figure out how do you draw the sword out of the scabbard? And I, and I said, if you want it to look at all sleek yes. and not like a gumboot, huh. it's got to be, it's got to have a slit because otherwise you've got a scabbard that just has to come out like this mm. and it will look like a boot. Yeah. Um, right, you are. Some, of the, some right. of the dwarven swords had that and it worked for them because dwarven swords are chunky, but right. this is meant to be slightly refined. Turning the side of this scabbard this way so that our mm. folks at home watching this main camera can see this is an opening that allows the blade mm. to actually, there it is, yes. see it? And you see the problem here is that if you grip that scabbard like that and, and you could draw cut it, yourself, ah oh, yeah. Yes. And uh, for the collectible edition where there were a few people that ordered them with sharp blades and yes. a scabbard, they were given some, they were like things plastered everywhere saying, do not do this. Yeah. <laughs> do not hold it here. Do wow. not do not do this and do this because oh, it'll wow. be bad. Wow. Is, is there any historical significance to this type of of uh, shape and scabbard? Um, for the sword itself, that blade is very comparable to a medieval European style of sword called a falchion. Falchion. Yep. Which Let's was which was a one edged Whoa. slashing sword. Wow. And in fact, the shape. Yeah, the shape is pretty much a medieval European falchion. The hilt, of course, is quite different, dragon teeth being in short supply in medieval Europe. Oh, this is the, uh, the dragon tooth hilt. Yes. Okay, yeah. okay. And there, I know there have been a lot of debates over, is it wood? But no, it is meant to be a dragon tooth. Um, and in really? fact, Paul Tobin, who was no. the lead designer, see those little ridges on both sides? Yes. Those are actually copied off shark teeth. Shark teeth have this these same little edges. ridges. Yeah. Yes, yes, they do. They do indeed. Um, wow. And that was because he comes from a background of anthropology, I think, and you know, um, animal biology and stuff. So he knew things. 
in the chat room, were any real swords and scabbards designed with a ballooning blade slit? What is a ballooning blade slit? I'm not sure. That's a new term. That's a new term. Mm. Well, that's what Wikipedia is for. We're going to look it up. <laughs> that's exactly it. Would that be a dragon tooth in the, in, in the Lord of the Rings mythology? The, the, there was a backstory invented that um, during the First Age, um, several dragons were fought against by the elves and various others. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, it, I think it took an awful lot to defeat a dragon. Mm. And I don't think any of the dragons were ever killed in the mythology, but maybe one of them got a tooth knocked out, and that being retrieved, it was incorporated into... Um, into Orchrist. What was the word? Uh, oh, we'd have to scroll balloon, back. It was a balloon yeah. sheath? Blade. Balloon I'm not blade. sure. A Unless you mean a sheath that can actually expand and as the blade is drawn through it, but I don't think that would work because the blade would still slice it open. Yeah. Roji Fox says, I cringe every time I watch the movie and he first pulls the sword from the sheath. Yes. Laugh out loud, Chinese swords work exactly the same way. There, there is a there is a scene where he does exactly what I described, where you see him pulling the sword out yeah. in close up, and the blade is doing this right thing. Here. It's actually pushing his fingers out as it goes. Oh, past. <laughs> he's, gra he's grabbing it right. right. Yes, exactly. Oh. Where Richard yeah. actually grabs it that way. Yes, <laughs> that's funny. Yes, a, a few people have spotted it, but surprisingly, a lot of people haven't. I think the biggest continuity problem that I've ever had. And there aren't many, like you said, mm. very, very yeah. proud statistics that mm. the Rings crew could have so few for doing almost, you know, 10 hours or more. Counting mm. the extended editions, mm -hmm. we've got almost 11 and a half or 12 hours of film for those three in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. But the fact that Orcrist mm. does not share the same characteristic of glowing blue mm -hmm. when orcs or goblins yes. are near, and neither does Glamdring. Mm -hmm. yes. And we always knew that, that yeah. Peter made a conscious decision. Yeah that Glamdring would not glow, yeah. but we thought that Orchrist would at least. Look, it, it even carries yeah. mm. the same yes. designs, and it's yeah. meant to be mm. quite a yeah. companion piece to yeah. Sting, right? Yeah. Well, when I first saw the final design that was approved for Orchrist, mm. one thing I loved was that if you, it's, if you mirrored that sword along the, the center line the, of the ridge, you would actually have a blade that looks very much like Sting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not quite the same, oh, yes. but, but mirrors it. So it's almost yes. like a sting blade that's been sliced off yes. one edge. Let's show and, them um, side by side. Yeah. It actually, you can see the, yeah. the shapes, how they work very similarly. And I thought that was actually good because it also goes with the, the nickname of Goblin Cleaver. Mm. Yes. And, of course, that is an obviously cleaving sword. So what you're saying is Bilbo is just Thorin's mini-me. <laughs> <laughs> Thorin's <laughs> mini me. Hi, Connor. Welcome to the show. Hello, yeah. Tolkien girl. We got, we got so many people. In so many people in, in the in, chat. In, in, in yeah. the last few minutes, if you're mm. just joining us, this is Torn Tuesday. We're yeah. talking with swordsmith Peter Lyon from Weta, and uh, he is seen all over the appendices. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, banging on metal yep. <laughs> and uh, and making things, and he's also mm. responsible yep. for. The, uh, was it the Master Collection? Yeah, the Master Swordsmith Collection. Master Swordsmith yes. Collection from Weta Workshop, mm -hmm. where you, they're very limited editions, 2550. I mean, they're not mass produced mm. uh, in some other country. They're by your hand. Yes. Yeah. We wow. have We've had a That's lot of awesome. questions coming mm -hmm. in about... Uh, That's awesome. Let's talk about people. I mean, you know, the, the sword community is, is pretty small nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Did you have any interactions with Bob Anderson? Very little, actually. Um... I, I knew of him and some of his previous work before he arrived, but um, he didn't really come to Weta beyond a couple of times, so he was mostly working with the actors and uh, and on set. For mo mostly about like form and, and yeah. holding and, and um, performance? Well, when, it, when it comes to stage fighting, which is essentially what all film combat is, mm -hmm. it's you don't actually need real combat techniques. It would be nice to know you know, where combat techniques from history have been used in films, but you don't need to do that because part of the storytelling is you've got a three second cut, here's your action, it blends into your next cut, which is this action. Mm -hmm. And so it actually needs a stage combat specialist like Bob Anderson to do that because he right. understands not just the sword play, but 
the process of filmmaking and how it interacts and makes the filmmaking easier. Mm -hmm. Now, in the appendices, it, everyone loves the fact that, that Vigo has, mm -hmm. was, was yeah. walking all mm -hmm. around with this sword. Total yeah. method actor. Yeah. Yeah. Did any other actors walk around with their swords? Sleeping and, and, with the sword. And, no. and right night. Night. How did that make you feel? That um, I thought it was actually quite cool that Vigo did that. I don't know if all the stories are true, but I actually have a feeling that most of them are. I do know that that one where he tramped across country to go fishing, tramped over cross country overnight to go fishing in the morning. Yes. He did do that. I did hear a story that he actually walked up Courtney Place in Wellington with his sword. I have my doubts about that one. <laughs> New Zealand's a small place, but it's not that small. It, 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 knowing that, you know, him and possibly the other actors walking around with yeah. their swords, mm. uh, I but, mean, but, is there anything yeah. that, like, m made you uh, pause for concern? Like, oh, man, if I knew he was going to show this to everybody. Like, like, no, I was actually really pleased about that because I made the sword and made sure that the scabbard, as, you know, as far as I was involved with it, was rigged properly, that it would balance nicely. I was really happy to, to know that he was doing that because I made a sword that could do that that it was made to take that, it might get a little bit of rust and have to be cleaned up, but so what? Swords do that. Um, and so I thought it was really cool that he did that. And for him, what he was doing it, while he was doing that was he was wanting to get away from this thing that you get sometimes in film and stage plays where actors strut around with, you know, gripping the, the hilt of the sword <laughs> and saying, look, I'm carrying a sword. Whereas he's a guy who's been knocking around in the wilderness for years the sword should be so familiar that he does things like uses the pommel for a hand rest. I mean, which is what I used to do when I was doing historical sword play. When I was, you know, I just used the pommel as a hand rest. Yeah. And it's a very casual thing that you get by wearing that and the gear that goes with it and just getting totally familiar with it. How, uh, how long does it actually take to make a sword? Did you have, uh, it does it, has it taken, did you have less time to make them for The Hobbit? How does that compare to your master collection? Mm -hmm. I mean, how much actual... Okay. Um, to give a rough idea, Boromir's sword would be one of the simpler styles, so that was around about 50 hours work to make the make that for Lord of the Rings. Andril was closer to 100 hours work because it's a bigger sword, it's got etching, it's got more fiddly details. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of a general scale, 50 to 100 hours work. The Master Swordsmith Collection swords actually are taking a bit more work individually because I'm being much more finicky about the details and so I'm getting in there and getting little things really crisp that I could get away with for the film but I know that when a collector is in some cases are literally going to be standing there for hours looking at the sword it's got to be perfect now I, I, I see the cringe on our collector's faces. Our greasy <laughs> fingerprints oh. are all over this metal. Yes. It, it does. Do, are we so not supposed to handle the metal generally, with greasy generally hands? Generally not. I, I try not to touch blades very much. Uh, for is, is that just for presentation purposes, or is it act, does it actually affect well, the metal? Well, it depends or? what the steel is. If it's a stainless steel, it, it's generally okay. But even stainless steels will rust. That's what, that's sort of a myth that they don't rust. Mm -hmm. But they don't rust so easily. But it's just good practice to, I try to mostly handle it by things like grips. And if I'm holding a blade, I try to hold it by the smallest area. It's just, I've gotten so used to handling swords over the years that I, I realize that if I handle them and then don't clean them up immediately, they're probably going to get rust. Which doesn't matter if they're meant to look old, mm -hmm. but if they're not meant to look old, that's a bit of a problem. So it, it, we apologize to our wonderful <laughs> collector, <laughs> Kyle. He's been a featured guest on our show. He's one of the best <laughs> cosplayers in Southern California. Yeah. This is the man who created, the only man who created the Fountain Citadel Guard yes. of Minas Tirith. Oh. The, with the feathers in that yes. helm, yep. he's the only man who's ever oh. redesigned the perfect version of Excellent. that Fountain Guard from yeah. the Citadel. It's a beautiful costume, too. And it's outrageous. And, and he you actually, don't see it much. No, yeah, that's why. Mm. That's why you don't see it much. Is but it true that we've got fingerprints all over your stuff. I'm was sorry. too long for its scabbard? Nope. Okay. Uh, oh, that's an easy one. <laughs> can, can you flip, did, did you watch the Pirates of the Caribbean? Uh, Orlando Bloom was in that series yeah. as well. Yeah. Can, can you actually like flip a sword like Orlando does all over pirates? I mean, they're always like... You do, can. Do, do, do. You try doing it ten times in a row, though. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it once. I mean, it's something I used to do with my blunt practice swords. I'd just flick them up, and usually I'd grip, 
the, the grip would just come around and go thunk, into my hand and then occasionally it would just go flobble and land on the ground. Yeah. So yeah, it's the sort of thing yes you can do. And if you've got ten takes to get it right, who cares? <laughs> ten takes. To so get how it are right. you supposed to? How are collectors supposed to take care of them? I mean, th- this is representative of any sword collector. Mm-hmm. Once you buy one, you yes. start buying them all. Mm-hmm. You buy them on eBay. Yeah. You buy them on sales. It's you, true. You go to conventions. Is it is it Windex and paper towels? Is it is soft soft cloths? Like what what is proper care mm-hmm. maintenance for these metals? Uh, different people have different different ideas about how a sword should be protected. I'm nervous uh, my right favorite now. is... You should be nervous right now, yeah. boys. You should okay. be nervous. Um, <laughs> I, I used to use things like, um, you know, you've got your favorites like CRC and 5.56 and WD-40 that a lot of people use. I yeah. hate them. WD-40? That's a popular American brand. They're, they're, they're too volatile. Yeah. So, so they've got too many volatiles in them mm. and quite often they've got other things in them that are made for doing things like loosening rusted bolts, which are actually potentially not good for steel long term. Oh, yeah, yeah, of so, course. So uh, the other thing is uh, things like motor oils. They do stay on the blade, but they get gluggy. Mm-hmm. So And also they're thick enough. If you want a good protection, they're thick enough that they're visible. They rub off in sides of scabbards too. My favorite is actually wax. Really? Yeah, and my very favorite is um, automotive polish, yeah. wh- which has a very fine polish in it, and then it leaves behind a microcrystalline wax, which is a very hard coating. Yes. And so you polish as you wax. Oh, that's kind of fabulous. Yeah. That's yeah. a great... And, and, you know, Canuba wax is an alternative as a straight-up wax. If they only had that back in yep. the 1600s. They did. Right? They did? Oh, they did. Yeah. Oh. I mean, not that. Uh, the, what I used to use on my uh, medieval swords, my reenactment swords, that is, not real medieval swords, I wish, um, was um, a mixture of olive oil and beeswax. Oh, and then cool. I'd, I'd get the ratios right so that uh, it was a solid at room temperature. I'd rub it with a, a rag, warming it up. It goes greasy, rub it on the blade, it hardens, rub off the excess. Cool. And if you want it to store for a long time, you could just leave it on thick. Someone said, I think it was Scott in the live chat, said, I know there was a sword created for Sauron, mm-hmm. but it was not there used. Was. Really? That's right. That's right. Yes. Uh, see, now, that's now, the stuff okay. we want to see in the okay. ultimate edition. Now, now you you will know that in the original <laughs> I plan, know. you know you'll know that in the original plan, the studio wanted there to be the you know the hero versus the bad guy face off. Yeah. Aragorn versus Sauron in Return of the King. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now that was part of the original plan, but eventually common sense prevailed, and everyone said, but that would last about half a second. <laughs> Uh, yeah. With it with a accompanied by a squishy noise. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and so common sense prevailed and yes, this sword that was going to be used by Sauron to fight Aragorn was made uh. but it was never used. It does get seen, sort of. Really? In the art there, you know the scene where the Witch King is going into his armory and he selects that horrendous ball and chain. Yes. And you see all the stuff mm-hmm. in silhouette. Yes. Yes. Sauron's sword is in there. In silhouette. Somewhere, really? Somewhere. Yeah, there's, there's a camera move, and yep. someone's about to put this weird helm on the Witch King. Yep. Yeah, he's getting dressed mm. up, yep. which is kind of like a parallel to where Theoden yes. is getting yeah. similarly dressed mm-hmm. up and ready for battle. Mm. Yeah. Right? But the, 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 almost, oh. the almost Sauron sword is in, is in there. Okay. <laughs> just as a background prop. Got to see it. The almost yeah. Sauron sword. I've got yep. to see you it. You know, we got a text message. I want to reframe this question, but they asked, how, how did you get your start in sword making? I want to reframe, yeah. reframe that mm-hmm. as, t- tell us about that story. And like a lot mm. of people are like, how do I get started now? Uh, I'm sure you get that at yes. conventions all okay. the time. But should they? Should they get into yes. 3D okay. printing instead of metal right. writing? Okay, so there's really two questions there. Okay. One is how I got started in the 1980s versus how you'd get started 30 odd years later. Yes. So back in the 80s, I was getting into medieval reenactment in New Zealand, the far end of the world, literally. We're at, you know, we're about as, just about as far away from anything as you can get, except uh-huh. maybe Easter Island. Uh-huh. And no internet. No internet mm-hmm. So we couldn't get stuff. So that's why I started making stuff. People started saying, oh, I'll give you money to make stuff for me. So I started making stuff for reenactors. It grew from there. And I, the reason I got the work on Lord of the Rings after about 10 years making stuff for reenactors was uh, a friend of mine, and this is one of those wonderful movie stories, this is how the movie world works. A friend of mine who is a stunty in 1994 says to me, hey, I'm working on this 
film, I think it was... Uh, Meet the Feebles? Yeah. No, it wasn't Meet the Feebles. It was one of the other Splatter movies. Brain Dead. Or Dead Alive. Dead Alive. Because it was released it, in, under a it, different yeah, name. Dead yeah, Alive yeah. is what you know it is. Dead yeah. Alive, yeah. So he was doing stunt work and then said, hey, this guy, Richard Taylor, he's doing this stuff and he might be something, somebody worth knowing later on. <laughs> so I contacted Richard. <laughs> of course. He was working on Hercules, the TV series at the time, doing animatronics and props. Yeah. So I showed him what I was doing and him and the, the, the team there were really enthusiastic and like there were about eight of them, I think. Yeah. So this was, this was what Weta was at that time. Right. And um, but of course he said, well, we don't need these sort of things for Hercules, or on their budgets, and but if the right thing comes along, I'll give you a call. And so, four years later, the right the, thing the came call, along. The, the right thing came along. <laughs> oh boy, howdy! Yep, and that's sort of that's how it works sometimes. But as to how you do it today, um, with with stuff like three D modeling, three D milling, printing. It does change the way I would recommend people approaching. Like, I'm old school. I I use computers, but I d really don't want to understand them. I want them to do what I want. I don't want to have to know how they do it. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm a real luddite. Mm -hmm. But I'd say that if you're getting into it today, that knowing 3D processing would be really really useful. Mm -hmm. uh, there are sword makers out there high-end sword makers now that are, are doing things like they're using 3D metal prints or or 3D prints that they then get made into waxes to cast in bronze or whatever mm -hmm. for scabbard fittings and sword fittings and things like this. It makes sense, especially if you're going to make a few of them. Mm -hmm. um, there is, of course, there's the old school approach, but even with, uh, with 3D milling now and the high-end mills, you can mill the spring steel, yeah. Um, yeah. which is pretty hard work for a machine. Yeah. But you can do some very fancy things with that that would be so time consuming or effectively impossible to do by hand that it does open up real possibilities. So I would say, yeah, know the old school approach, but if you're inclined to computers, um, definitely get into the 3D side of things. And if you want to get into the film industry or pretty much any sort of manufacturing stuff, you really do need to know it. Or, yeah. or at least know how to tell somebody who knows it um, how to do stuff for you. Indeed. Indeed. Well, we are getting a lot of energy, a lot of talk, a mm -hmm. lot of questions. Yeah. We've already mm -hmm. been here an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. This has been an extraordinary show. Yeah. And we still have this mm -hmm. very energized group of fans sending all these questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> the qu the qu I think the question that everybody you know, wants to believe is that eventually uh, more Middle Earth shows or movies yes. will be made. Mm -hmm. And someday, as, <laughs> as we saw with yeah. The Hobbit, you know, technology has progressed. The Hobbit movies were made differently than Lord of the Rings. No more bigotures, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. a lot more digital. Oh, do you I miss think, the bigotures. Do, do you think, yeah. what, you know, we're years away from any mm -hmm. more Middle Earth films. Do you think it's going to change the filmmaking processes will change that much more? That be, being positioned in the 3D printing space okay. or whatever? Let, let, let's suppose, I guess, sometime in the future, maybe another 10 years, this notional uh, connecting film or a Silmarillion or whatever happens, mm -hmm. that there will still be room for hand props. You'll always mm -hmm. need hand props mm -hmm. because you can't always just hand an actor a, a stick with a ball on the end and say, act. Some people can <laughs> do that. Some people can do that. Some actors just can't work that way. So giving them real hand props, working on real sets yeah. or in real scenery is still going to really have its place. Always. Um, and of course it's good for people like me because even if, you know, there'll still be the things like these days where you've got a scene where somebody gets stabbed with a sword, you tend to give them a stub sword and then the rest of the blade is digital. Yes. That's easy to do now and it's a hell of a lot safer than things like retracting blades mm -hmm. which sometimes decide not to retract. <sighs> Yeah. Um, stuff like that <coughs> so yeah I guess there is always still going to be a place for this mm -hmm. but obviously digital is the current thing on the bigotures side of thing you know how there's been this huge move until recent years of doing all stuff digitally and we all, we'll all know examples where it's been done beautifully and we'll all know examples where we just go ooh <laughs> Yes. And sometimes <laughs> it's not about how much money you throw at it. No. Either. Yes. Um, but there is 
not exactly a move towards using miniatures again, but there is still a place for them. So, uh -huh. like Fast and Furious 7, mm -hmm. there was a, a, a miniature used there for the house explosion scene. Yeah. Weta did that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked beautifully. If it's done right by people who understand the old school techniques, then it can work beautifully. Uh -huh. You do lose that absolute control that you get with a, an entirely digital setup, but the problem I've always had with digital setups is that the digital setup you get is only as good as the person doing it. Their understanding of physics and how things really work. And you know that, that, that the James Cameron loves this term, uncanny valley, where something mm -hmm. is almost perfect, but it's so slightly off that you just go, what? Yeah. Uh, and, that, and that's the thing that's really hard to get. So you can only be as good as the digital artist. The best digital artists are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes either the artist or the director might demand a certain thing. Mm -hmm. The director will get what they want, even if it just doesn't quite work. Even if it doesn't quite work. Have yeah. you seen any of the fan films like Hunt for Gollum? There's been a lot of like Lord of the Rings I, cause. I've seen a few. Not, I can't say I've seen a lot though. Yeah. Oh, there's only a f there's only two, uh, a couple of them that have mm -hmm. you know been really. What yeah. do you think of? You've been to a bunch of conventions, San Diego mm -hmm. Comic Con. Yeah. What do you think of the cosplay and and are, are people cosplaying? Are they making the weapons or do you see them making the costumes, bringing your weapons? Um, well, I suspect you won't be turning up to San Diego with too many of these mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the. Uh, the, you know, the, the whole well, no, also the sort of the, the whole orange tape rule. That, oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, unless yeah. you can really hold them in the scabbards, you wouldn't get them through security. That's mm -hmm. right. Um, whereas a foam one, you can. Yeah. But the cosplay is amazing. Yeah, you know, some of that, some of that cosplay, even in, when you look at it close up, holds up really well. Mm -hmm. But even even if it's something that, um, you know, where some are better than others, it's the enthusiasm that's gone into it that's amazing and also yeah. some people carry it off because they they do the character so well mm -hmm. absolutely now here's here's the thing that has come to my mind the fact that game of thrones mm -hmm. has literally put gandalf's yes. sword glamdring yeah. into the iron throne of westeros yeah <laughs> you are probably one of the first Peter Lyon, ladies and gentlemen. No, I was looking at the throne, and then I thought, hang on. Yeah, because we <laughs> yeah. Got, I know that. We've got the same shirt on. This is an accident. We didn't program wearing the same blouse at the wedding. We feel yeah. like a couple of bridesmaids here in the same patchy yeah. outfit. But look, the, this is where Sauron is sitting on the, yeah. the Iron Throne of ah. Westeros. And it is famously molded mm. out of all the swords of the king's yes. enemy. Mm. Uh, was, this, was this chair, I call it a chair, was this throne created by Targaryen, the mm. Mad King? Right in that world's history, someone, mm. yep, Song of Ice and Fire, deep cuts right here. But the fact <laughs> is that Glamdring yeah. ended up being yes. in there. That tells you how much people loved your work. Yeah. The people at HBO, <laughs> running their own <laughs> fantasy world, decided to borrow your sword and yeah. stick it in their most yeah. iconic I, I throne. Like, I like to think it's a bit of an homage to Lord yeah. of the Rings. It is. It is. Well, yeah, that, yeah, but they, they, they haven't called you for work. They didn't like it that much. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> they have their own crew. But I've got to, got to say, I love, I love Lord of the Thrones. It's appointment viewing for us. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, yeah, sorry, Game of Thrones. Well, no, we'll take it. Yes. We'll take Lord of the Thrones. We'll yeah. take it. <laughs> sorry. Well, well that, that was a... That was a hashtag. Yeah, that was a bit of a uh, Freudian step. Yeah, that's happening. <laughs> that's happening on the internet now. Hashtag Lord of the Thrones. Well, we want you fans to take that up and have some fun with that. That is actually happening. Well, this has been an amazing it conversation. It really has been. This has yeah. been fantastic. Yeah. Um, we got to talk about bringing all the swords in. Well, the yeah, swords that should be glowing, that aren't glowing blue, yeah. but they should have been. You know what? That's what I want to know. That Was there any... Uh, technology exploration for the Hobbit mm. um, actually making a glowing no. sword, D no. EL wire or anything? Do you? Is no, there? Not that I know of. Do you think there? There, could there was be? on Lord of the Rings. There was this. There was a trial with a, a clear plastic blade and firing an LED down it or something. But the effect was too patchy. Huh. Ah, right. And digital just makes it so. You know, digital gives you consistency. Yeah, basically. Speaking of cosplayers, before we wrap up this fantastic mm -hmm. show, do you have any cosplayers coming up to you specifically with weird requests or you know like oddball uh, ideas? Like, could you make this weapon for me? Blah blah oh, blah. Yeah, I've had a few of those over the years. Yeah. Uh, computer games in particular. Uh huh. Can you make me this yeah. steel, six foot long, six <laughs> inch wide, half inch thick oh, sword? Gosh. Oh gosh. And it's got to weigh three pounds. 
<laughs> and it's like, I'm sorry, but unless no. somebody comes up with a super light or foamed steel or something, right. it just ain't possible. I was waiting for someone to give you a request, can you forge me a sword that will absorb the souls of my victims? <laughs> little, sorry, a little katana reference for Suicide Squad yeah. fans out there. Not, yeah. That hasn't come to your table no, yet, no? no. no? no I have <laughs> had somebody tell me once that they made a plus one sword for a client, though. A plus one sword for a yeah, client? only plus one. Only plus one? <laughs> Damn, I want a plus six at least on my rolls with that weapon. All right, this has really been delicious. Um, I'm really glad to talk to the man who understands yeah. history mm. and the romanticism mm. and, the, and the context of why we relate to these swords. We know why Theoden is given yeah. a sword. Mm -hmm. We know why yeah. Aragorn walks up to Frodo and says, he doesn't say you have my life. He says you have my sword. And there's something about that yeah. storytelling which we are so mm. drawn mm -hmm. to, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that you were the man who was able to physically realize that idealism and that romance yeah. in all of your work. Yeah. And I'm just so grateful to have you here yeah. with us. Fun. Yes, Mr. Yes. Pete, Mr. Peter Lyons, lady, yeah. the th without thank an S. You. Peter Lyon, without the um, S. Thank you. <laughs> there you go, Kyle. All right. Thank and you for bringing the swords. Is there anywhere where people can find you online if they would like to, you know, uh, look at your... Uh, no, I, no. I do have you a website. You did say Lugite, didn't you? I do, I do have a website, but it yes. hasn't been updated for literally 10 years. Okay. So it's one of the things that I'm going to do later this year is okay. I, I, I'm going to learn a bit about website design and use one of the website things and finally get a, a website that I can actually uh, tell Great. people about Great. without cringing. All right. in but, the meantime, but at the moment, I'd prefer people not to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, they can go to Weta's uh, website. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, Weta's got much better photos of and, everything. And they, and they, they sell the, the, the Master Collection. Is that, yes. th That's what it's called, right? The Master, mm -hmm. master, yeah, master Swordsman, Swordsman Collection. Yes. And, and, uh, yep. Oh, Scott Weir is asking, is Boromir Sword confirmed for the next Master Swordsmith Collection? Live from the chat. It pretty much is. Yep. yep. You heard it here first, ladies yep. and gentlemen. <laughs> Bam. That's great. That, okay. Everyone's been wanting all the Boromir mm. stuff. They announced yep. at Comic-Con the, the new yep. figure, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with yeah. the arrows and, yep. and stuff like that. Yeah. So there's a there's a Boromir trend this year. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, yeah. in, I'm intrigued by this because I've seen his shield a million, yes. million times, yeah. but I've never seen this baby, the yeah. real Boromir sword, and I'm quite impressed. Mm. It's actually lighter it, it, and more manageable. Yeah, that's a lovely sword. Yeah, it really is. I love mm. this. And it's and I did uh, spend a bit of time snooping around some of the fan <laughs> sites, and <laughs> and the two swords that everyone kept talking about were Boromir yeah. and Arwen. And Arwen. Yeah. Ah, Arwen. yeah. Had, had what was it? Had Hadfadang, I think it is. Hathafang, yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. Something yeah. like you, that. You've got to you've got to have the right list. Yes. Well, when you when in Elvish, in the Elvish construct, when you put a D and an H together, yeah. it's like a TH sound, uh, like a th. Oh, that's probably why it's <laughs> mispronounced all the time. Yes. <laughs> when I was a child, I read Caradras, and I always thought the mountain was called Caradras. Yes. Years later, Ian McKellen tells me it's Karathras. And I'm like, ah, uh, oh, there's your Elvish. That's... Yep. That's how you know you're Elvish. Mm -hmm. you got to get it right. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you, yep. you, you've said a, a few times you pick up a sword and like, this is a good sword. You know, yeah. when, mm -hmm. when when Aragorn says that yes. in two towers, he picks yes. up, this is good. Yeah. He, yeah. I believe him. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. And I don't I, think and it's I think it's more than acting. I think yeah. he actually knows what a good sword yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the talks that I was giving in Sweden with another really good swordsmith, Peter Johnson, mm. we were talking about mythology, and one of Peter's points that he made was that particular scene where... Yeah, you know, he's got this cruddy old sword that's heavily corroded. We know that it's not much anymore, but it was a good sword. And it's also this whole thing of, by first of all, walking up and saying to this kid, this is a good sword. Yeah. It's him saying it, you know, mm -hmm. he's there, he's expecting to die like everyone else. Yeah. But he's also inducting that boy into the warrior cult. You know, the whole warriorhood thing by doing this. And yeah. if he survives, he is a proven warrior. Yep. And if he dies, he dies as a warrior too because he's got a good sword. <laughs> that scene just got more... So awesome. We're getting chills, getting goosebumps. <laughs> and, you know, the way the way that Thorin is laid to rest with mm -hmm. Orchrist right there on top yes. of him, mm -hmm. that is also part of, of the romance mm -hmm. and the yeah. power of that yes. That character belongs yeah. with that sword. Right. We don't ever, ever, ever think of our yeah. Lord of the Rings characters without their yes. weapons. Yeah, you know, I mean, we could we could do another whole session like this, just talking about the symbolism of the sword, because yes. because of the sword, you know, um, King Arthur, 
yeah. Excalibur. Ultimately. The sword and the king so closely yes. tied together. Yes. The symbolism is throughout history and mythology. Mm-hmm. And of course, films like Lord of the Rings feed on that and yep. use it. Yeah, smartly. Mm. Smartly too. I love it. Come back for that second show. Yeah. Peter one, Lyon. One day. It's a date. All right, it's a date. <laughs> First drink is on me, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being part of our show. As always, uh, we have the live the live chat on the oneringnet slash live. We've got the Facebook chat, which is fantastic. Lots of viewers from around the world. And very nice, Emily, thank you for staying up till 2.30 in the morning in the United Kingdom. It's great to see so many people yes. from Syria, from yeah. Finland, yeah. from Venezuela. Yeah, it is fantastic. The fans around the world, mm-hmm. like, just... Yeah. Or love this. Yes. Oh, Edwin. Yeah, thanks, Edwin. We did use your pick for the background. Thank you, Edwin <laughs> Gomez Jr. We really yep. appreciate mm-hmm. this is you, buddy. Yeah. And it's awesome. <laughs> we appreciate your part yeah. of the show too. See, this is the organic mm-hmm. grassroots yep. fan existence. Mm-hmm. We're we're so tuned in. And you guys, thank you for being tuned into us. Next week, I'm not sure who is going to be a surprise guest, but we'll figure out something fun. <laughs> Next week, we are uh, yeah, thank you, Justin. He's gonna go outside to the TriCaster. Um, and again, thank you, Justin, for co-hosting with me. Um, from all the way around the world, from all the way far, far away, second star on the right, and straight on yep. till morning, and you find your way back to New Zealand eventually. It's one of my favorite places on earth, yep. and I can't wait to come down and see you guys very yeah. soon. Yeah. I've been there four times. I'm going to come okay. back for number five. Oh, and this time I'll get to meet you again. Yes, sir. We'll do that again. I think I managed to miss you every other time, though. Every other time. Yeah. I know. You guys are, are really awesome, and thank yeah. you. So, this is Peter Lyon, and when you're ready to relaunch that website, you let us know. Yeah. And the OneRing.net will tell the whole world about oh. the relaunch. We'll get there. <laughs> so until we get it right, then. <laughs> yes, we'll get it right. Until next time, until next week, everybody, Melon means friend. So you can get in any door with just that password. We love you. Thank you very much for joining us on TheOneRing.net. This is Clifford Broadway signing off. Follow me at QuickBeam2000 on Twitter. We'll see you guys next time. Cheers. And thank you again, Peter.